Hi guys, it's been a while since I've had a solo video, but a subjectively stream commenter recently sparked an idea I just couldn't pass up. Redesigning our Mazda starters in the Gen 1 style. I have a tremendous soft spot for the timeless yet often endearingly clunky old school Pokemon art style, so I knew I had to rise to the occasion. Jack designed the Mazda starters with modern Pokemon design sensibilities in mind, so I thought it would be a ton of fun to re-examine each starter's core identity through the lens of the first Pokemon generation's design conventions. Along the way, I'd like to explain my process for creating watercolor-style artwork digitally, especially with respect to the early Sukumori style. I would also like to thank Atlas VPN for sponsoring this video. I'll talk about them in a little bit, but for now, let's get right to work with Malokata. Something worth noting about early Pokemon designs is that they were a lot simpler, both in concept and execution. This isn't a criticism. Many of my favorite Pokemon designs are from this era. Just something important to keep in mind as we go through this process. Malukata will remain identifiable as a little slug guy that lives inside pottery, but I think the current helmeted look probably wouldn't have been an option for the early pixel artists working with limited space. I reinterpreted the concept so that Malakata is still a teeny creature living inside a terracotta pot, but now the pottery takes up most of the design space, and the rest of the wiggly limbs extend from the main terracotta house sort of like Shuckle. Moving on to rendering, I needed to capture the charming feeling of the traditional ink and watercolors that were used for official Pokemon art. The main thing to keep in mind when attempting to create traditional looking art with digital tools is a consideration of texture. Sugimori and the original Pokemon artists worked in a medium with a tangible body to them and would paint on a thick variety of paper that's necessary to support watercolor without bleeding. Because watercolor paper needs to have a semi-absorbent quality, they're usually pressed with a cotton blend that leaves the paper with a really appealing pulpy texture. As watercolor paint fills out the grooves and irregularities left by the pulp, the pigment becomes subtly more concentrated in these depressions. This variation due to the uneven surface of the paper is why watercolor on paper looks so textured. I've been trying to digitally copy the textured look of watercolor for literal years now, and through trial and error, eventually figured out the best way to do so is by sampling real paint textures with digital brushes. As a former painting major, I figured it would be a shame if I didn't use my own old artworks to do just that. If you also want to use my brush presets, they're available on Gumroad. You probably don't necessarily need these exact brushes, but you will otherwise need to find a variety of good texturizers that respond to pen pressure in order to follow my steps for this process. Before adding color, I added clean line work over my sketch using the hard pencil inker with smoothing turned up. Hard edged brushes make the lines look super crisp, just like old school Sugimori scans, but this brush also adds some grit to make sure it doesn't look too clean. Something I personally love about the Pokemon art from this era are all the wiggly, squiggly imperfections still present in the official art. I think I like seeing the visual evidence of an artist's hand in the final piece because it offers a little glimpse into both the creative process and the artist's labor, two things that can be easy to take for granted when you're only looking at the end result. Handily, it also means my lines don't need to be perfect, which is great for me as someone who usually skips the line art step altogether. Color-wise, mimicking that classic watercolor look can be tricky with digital art. This is where the element of texture we already discussed is most relevant. Real watercolors are delicate. Watercolor rendering is accomplished by building up layers and layers of translucent washes of color in darker areas and leaving the highlights to be implied mostly through negative space. The beautiful gradient passages and official artwork from this era are achieved by covering an area in water and then adding just a touch of pigment and letting it bloom through the water on its own. A lot of control is relinquished to the water rather than meticulously guided by the artist. Unfortunately, letting the water be a girl boss is not something Photoshop can handle, so instead we need to take an additive approach by building up layers of progressively brighter colors using really textured brushes. The MVP of my digital watercolor technique is the textured wet blending brush which, depending on pen pressure, can either be used to fill in areas opaquely or add dramatic painterly transitions. 
I used this brush to lay down a lot of my initial color choices, which I would then refine with the wet wide textured wash brush and frayed bristle texturizer. The wide brush is really nice for mimicking the suggestion of wet brush marks at the edge of highlights, and the frayed texturizer is super useful for softening gentler color transitions that are still reading a little too harshly. Technique aside, the actual color decisions I made for Malukata were pretty simple. I tried to preserve Malukata's official colors, just making some minor adjustments for the sake of honoring the lovely old school style. One particular quirk I noticed in old Sugimori watercolors is that the highlight color would become both brighter and more saturated right before transitioning into the pure white negative space. So I tried to mimic that with brighter yellow greens alongside the base tones I chose for Malukata's palette, especially in the leaves and cheeks. And that's pretty much it for our first beta Mazamon. Here's the final. I don't know about you guys, but working with this art style is like taking a really nice stroll down memory lane. It brings back memories of simpler times and specifically of the hours I would spend poring over the art in this particular Pokemon I Spy book that I absolutely loved. Back when this was still the official style of Pokemon art, I was too young to be worried about the modern woes of paying bills, taxes, and protecting our internet data. On that note, let me take just a moment to talk to you guys about this video's sponsor, Atlas VPN. If you don't already know, a VPN or virtual private network is a service that securely encrypts your data as you access it in real time by routing it through secure servers. This means that your browsing stays private, protected, and unrestricted. By connecting to one of Atlas VPN's over 750 secure servers, you can bypass location-locked content, get the best deals when shopping online, and block harmful ads and malware from disrupting your online experience. One Atlas feature I'm really excited about is the Breach Scanner, which automatically scours the net to ensure personal information linked to your email hasn't been exposed online. Data breaches happen all the time, and getting ahead of these incidents with Breach Scanner can literally save your accounts from being compromised or stolen. Atlas offers the best, most affordable VPN deal on the market. You can enjoy the most affordable online protection today for just $183 a month and three months free with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Secure these huge savings by clicking the link in the video description below. This offer only runs for a limited time, so don't delay. Thanks again to Atlas for sponsoring us, and let's return to our Gen 1 throwback. I was able to cook up the basic idea for Beta Malukata pretty quickly, and had landed on a solid idea by just my second sketch. However, Quetzalcoatl was totally different. Trying to simplify a bejeweled and royally adorned feathered serpent Pokemon to the comparatively modest sensibilities of early Pokemon designs was a big challenge, and it took many iterations before I settled on a concept I thought might fit the bill. I originally tried to take Beta Quetzalcoatl in a sort of Charmander-ish direction and explored a plucky fire chicken look, but couldn't find a way to make that body plan seem both representative of Quetzalcoatl and unique from similar Pokemon like Torchic. I ended up exploring a number of different ideas, some more wormy and some more avian, but I honestly had a lot of trouble settling on an idea I felt good about. You can see my uncertainty carry through even after I settled on a final design, in the inking and coloring steps, where I changed the Firo-esque feather tufts to a cape of fire instead. The design I chose relies on simple serpentine features that are accented by a pair of downy wings and a modest Gen 1 horn that replaces Quetzalcoatl's more ornate feather crest and headdress. Animalistic features, especially random horns, were definitely the go-to adornment du jour in this generation of Pokémon, whereas apparel-like design elements were used almost exclusively for more humanoid Pokémon like Mr. Mime and Machamp. If I had another day to sketch, I think I'd like to explore a way to better express Quetzalcoatl's snooty yet fiery personality, but I think what I ended up with is perfectly serviceable. It reads as endearingly ugly cute in a Patamon sort of way, which I'm just fine with. That said, please let me know in the comments if you think any of the earlier sketches were more exciting and or more representative of Quetzalcoatl, and how you would improve them to get them up to snuff. I kept the color palette pretty true to the standard warm tones you'd expect from an early fire starter. Once I changed the feather mane to a bib of fire, I realized I needed to break up the big fields of solid color in the snake body, 
On top of the simple yellow red yellow pattern, white bands add a teensy but necessary pop of contrast that's still very much in the sneak scale pattern playbook. Something unspoken but implied in my Malukata commentary is the absence of black shadows in this coloring style. The Sugimori watercolor style is exposed for information in the mid-tones and shadows, whereas the highlights are left as pure paper white and carry almost no visual information. Choosing an exposure setup like this is an intentional stylistic choice to leave out or minimize information in a certain brightness range to make the information in the remaining brightness ranges that much more impactful. Since the highlights here are blown out, it wouldn't make sense to include black or desaturated shadows that similarly carry no information. Furthermore, dark pigments would dampen the fun, whimsical nature of early Pokemon art saturated color palettes and ultimately be detrimental to the illustration's ability to support and reflect the subject matter. In this particular illustration, I found myself using the textured watercolor render brush quite a few times in situations where I needed a little extra kick of spicy high contrast texture, especially in the smaller transitional areas. The soft watercolor render brush was also really great for rendering <laughs> within exposed areas with a subtler touch than the crunchier brushes. Like I said, this design was a bit of a hassle for me. While I like the end result, I can't help but feel like it could be improved with a bit more experimentation and finagling. If you have ideas for adjustments on this one, be sure to drop them in the comments, and maybe I'll come back to the series another time. After all the trouble I had with Quetzalil, I was worried I would become likewise stumped while sketching for Porcite. Luckily, this was not the case, and I landed upon an idea I thought worked pretty well as a reinterpretation of Porcite's themes fairly quickly. Referencing features in Dugong and Lapras, I stuck to a pretty straightforward chibi dolphin body plan. The bubble musical note helmet was definitely too complex for this era of Pokemon starters, but I still wanted to include this important motif of Porcite's evolutionary line somehow. I settled on the idea of little bubble floaties, which I thought would work well since starters usually have a young implied personality anyway. I had some hesitancies selecting colors and markings. I wanted to do a gradient on the fluke dolphin tail, similarly to Goldeen's delicate koi markings, since I thought that would add a sense of elegance and also be a fun challenge to create with digital tools. I definitely didn't want to settle for a monochromatic palette though, as that felt way too boring for a starter Pokemon. As a complementary color, yellow made the most sense to use as a secondary chroma, plus it adds a little sunshiny pep to an otherwise cool, mild palette. I ended up going with a simple half-moon countershading pattern to keep the design flowy and uncomplicated. This design still feels just a little strange to me. While I was working on it, I was simultaneously worried about it being too complex for the standards of Gen 1, but also too simple to be an exciting starter Pokémon. I kept feeling like it needed just a little extra pizzazz, but struggled to find a way to incorporate extra sparkle without crowding the composition. In retrospect, maybe the thing that needed changing was just the pose? The sketch I took to the final illustration is pretty straightforward and admittedly not very expressive. Since Porcite has a sort of meek personality compared to the other two starters, I felt okay with a bland pose initially. I think my relief at not getting super stuck in the sketching stage, like I did with Quetzalil's design, also played a part in maybe settling too quickly. Again, I do like this Porcite concept, I just wish I had found a more expressive, characterizing way to render it. Speaking of rendering, getting the bloom of color on Porcite's fluke just right took some experimentation. I really wanted this area to look like there was a background of pigment settling in an unrestrained cauliflower pattern. Actually achieving this effect definitely required some ebb and flow of additive and reductive steps. What ended up working best was alternating between adding color with the wet wide textured wash brushes softer transitions and then adding back the paper texture with the sharper edge of the textured watercolor render brush. Here's the final result. And with Porcite's design finalized, at least for now, that marks the last of our Maza beta designs. Please tell me what you guys think, not just about these designs, but also how you feel about the difference between the 90s Pokemon look and the modern Pokemon of today. 
Personally, I appreciate the differences between the retro and modern generations, and have favorite Pokemon from both Gen 1 and Gen 9. Thank you again to Atlas VPN for sponsoring this video. If internet security is a big deal to you, be sure to grab Atlas VPN now for just $1.83 a month plus three free months before their big deal expires. Before I go, I'd also like to extend a huge thank you to our patrons, whose support makes Subjectively possible especially our super subjectivists, Rose and Angel S. Our Patreon updates with exclusive pledge rewards every month, so be sure to check it out if you'd like to support Subjectively directly. Thank you guys so much, and we'll catch you in the next video.